The Easter event, Christ's resurrection, is an incredible claim. But even if we admit to its historicity, what does it mean? In today's message, Dr. Dan Doriani talks about the common arguments skeptics have to the resurrection and to the Christian faith. More importantly, he talks about the significance of the resurrection and its implications for followers of Christ. The mission of letting others know of this great happening and how Christ's new life brings new life to us all. It is indeed uh, the Easter season still, and I want to uh, connect to Easter and to the fact that it's Mission Sunday in our church. And so Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, is our passage today. And we'll consider the mission that God has in this world and in our own lives and um, right here in our neighborhoods. Listen to God's word. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 28 to you. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted or hesitated. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's just pray together for a moment. Lord, speak to us through um, this part of your will that is uh, well-known, and yet in some ways hard, even controversial. Teach us, Lord, to live under your mission, your commission and your mission, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, I was uh, in a conversation regularly with a man I'm going to call Mike. Mike uh, was sort of a neighbor of ours, and uh, my wife, Debbie, had become a friend of his wife, and they decided we should get together, and, and so we did. We talked about things. We played sports together. Mike was an atheistic professor, and uh, Mike was willing to talk about anything and everything, and I was willing as well. And so one day around the Easter season, we uh, got into a conversation about the resurrection, and it went on literally for hours, I mean, till midnight and beyond. And um, after long conversation, he said, you know what, okay, Dan, I, ac I accept it. The evidence for the resurrection, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is compelling. That does not make me a Christian, however. This world is a strange place, there are all kinds of laws that we haven't fathomed, uh, we haven't discerned the way in which this world works. Strange things happen, the resurrection of Jesus is one of them. Now, it really surprised me, to be honest, that this atheist was willing to say that Jesus rose from the dead. But as I thought about it later, I realized that, of course, as a professor, as an intelligent man, what he was really doing was cutting off the conversation because he didn't want to become a Christian. He didn't want to say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I will conduct myself according to his standards. I will be his disciple. That's the one thing he was not willing to say. Therefore, to get me off his case, because I was making good points, he said, I'll concede the bodily resurrection, but please, please do not tell me that I have to follow the, the will and the ways of Jesus. Well, uh, that very resistance to being a disciple is um, our theme today, or the resistance and giving in, we might say. Jesus tells his disciples to make disciples of the nations. He says, teach them to obey everything. It could be translated, every last thing I have commanded you. Now that uh, commission is familiar to disciples, but it's, um, it's not popular with everybody. We call it evangelism. The world sometimes calls it proselytizing. Now evangelism and proselytizing are really both the same thing. Uh, to evangelize is to say, I've got something for you. I've got truth for you that you should receive. But, um, and proselytizing means to try to convince someone that you are right, especially in religious matters, that this is the truth. But to proselytize in secular circles is kind of an insult or an offense. People say, I don't want to be your project. Don't try to convert me. I'm very happy with my life. Now, the different reasons why people resist, uh, many of them are like my friend Mike, not his real name, people who have substantial objections to Christianity on the one side, but really mostly simply don't want to do 
what Jesus says. Not everybody wants to be a disciple. And why would that be? Well, there's a, a book that's come out and gotten quite a bit of stir in the last uh, 10 days or so uh, called Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics. Now, that may sound to you like a book that uh, runs down Christianity, but actually not at all. It's written by a man named Ross Duthat, who um, is an ardent Christian and wants to take the argument for Christianity uh, to the culture and is debating secular people um, on a regular basis about the nature of Christianity and secularism, how the two interact. Um, but early in the book, he concedes that Christians have done, or the church has done, any number of things, and Christian teaching uh, runs at odds with our culture so that Christianity doesn't sound very good or feel very good to large numbers of people. I'm going to mention just a few of the things that he talks about and add one of my own. The first that he mentions is the Christian sex ethic. See, for the sec secular person, uh, the sexual revolution of the 60s and the 70s makes the Christian ethic for physical or sexual morality look unreasonable. Uh, today, um, the great majority of all people cohabit at least for a while before they get married. And the great majority uh, do not, as we say, save themselves for marriage. And our society has been practicing non-Christian or anti-Christian principles for so long that the Christian view simply seems unreasonable. It seems unhealthy. People come to physical maturity around the age of 14 or so, and they get married around the age of 26 or 27 or so, and you want people to wait half a lifetime to uh, fulfill this natural desire. It seems stifling. It seems unhealthy. It seems to be a denial of, of, of who we are and, and regressive and unhealthy and, and impossible. Now, um, there was an argument long ago in the 60s and 70s that people advanced. Now people don't really, they just do now. But there used to be an argument, a persuasive argument, went like this. Um, the biblical ethic of, of the Old Testament and the New used to make some sense. And you can explain the call for fidelity um, and sexual expression only within marriage this way. Long ago, you really couldn't have births outside of wedlock. It was just too disruptive to society. It was too dangerous for women who need to be protected by and depend on men in ages past. But of course, that's not a consideration anymore. I mean, we're modern people. We can prevent, so the secular person says, we can prevent unwanted pregnancies. We have ways of dealing with that. And women today aren't dependent on men. They can live their own lives. They're they're educated and liberated, and they can get jobs just as well as men, maybe better in some ways. And so women don't need protection anymore, and so the prohibitions aren't needed anymore. That's what the secular person says. And the vast majority of people in our society tend to go along with that, not necessarily uh, by conviction, but people drift toward what everybody else does. Very, very few people choose to cohabit before marriage. They rather stay overnight two or three or five or ten or twenty times, and then, and then there they are. People don't choose it, they drift into it. And, and study after study after study after study by universities, by secular people, by every group you can think of shows that premarital cohabitation leads to more divorce, more unhappiness, and we just keep on going. And there's really no reason, you know, people think, well, if I get married and do things the Bible way, I'll lose my freedom to live my life as I please. Can I just say one thing? You can get married at the age of 23 and still tour Europe. You do not have to be single to tour Europe. You can get married and go with your spouse. It's legitimate activity. Number two, politics. The political polarization between the left and the right has entered into the life of the church. If you know the way churches work, the main line or liberal churches went left, and the conservative or evangelical churches went right, and society now thinks that churches are beholden to politics. The churches follow politics, that churches are, that the church is a tool of politicians, appendages, pawns, instead of 
Speaking into politics, the secular person says, we serve politics. The truth of the matter is, I think there's, some, there's something to this. In the Old Testament, God ordained three leaders of the people of Israel, prophets, priests, and kings. And the kings, of course, led the body politic, and God ordained that prophets, and priests a little, but especially prophets, should have the right, the obligation, the power to step into the king's palace and tell him, thou shalt not. That's wrong. In other words, God knew that when all the powers of a society are aligned, they can all join in wickedness or oppression. And so it's necessary, since we all have a sin tendency and can go astray in different ways, it's necessary that the political leaders should have a spiritual leader who's able to say, no, you're wrong. Um, I'll speak candidly. Most people at Central Presbyterian Church, right or wrong, whatever your view is, I don't care. There are, there are more people who are registered as Republicans at Central Presbyterian Church than as Democrats. And for that reason, I say this. Rush Limbaugh is not a theologian. Rush Limbaugh is not the voice of God in our age. You may agree with him, you may disagree with him, but he's just a guy talking politics. And too many, too many believers identify, on one side, conservative Christianity with conservative politics, and too many on the other side identify liberal Christianity with liberal politics. They're not the same thing. They're independent. And the church is healthiest when, it, when we know that Jesus is not a Republican or a Democrat, and no political party has the truth, and we speak God's truth into our culture. I'll give you one illustration. Um, the prisons in America are full. We have more prisoners per capita than just about any other country, and we have more prisoners absolutely than any other country in the world. And if you listen to uh, conservative politicians, there's a very big uh, lock them up, put them away, make society safe. And Prisons are mentioned in the Bible a handful of times, and they are never prescribed or ordained. There is not one law in the Bible that says lock them up. Not one. Now, the Bible has a penal code, and it punishes misbehavior in various ways. And I'm not saying we should never have prisons today because society's changed. We can't reinstitute Israel as it was long ago. But biblical ethics and Conservative politics simply don't always line up. Again, considering why people in our age um, don't necessarily like Christianity. First, sex ethics. Second, politics. Third, there is a tendency among the leaders in our culture to ignore Christianity, to sort of rule it out, to pretend it doesn't exist, to try to explain everything um, by natural means. There's a strange paradox here, but the elites of our culture generally pretend Christianity can't explain stuff or really has nothing to say. It belongs on the front pages or the analysis pages, but in the, on the, um, in the human interest pages. This is the way religious people behave. But the funny thing is that college grads go to church far more than high school grads do. And professionals go to church even more than high school dropouts do. It's a huge gap. Nonetheless, our leaders in the media, the academy, the arts say, let's ignore Christianity. The Christian says that God has a central role in explaining all of our lives, all of our behavior. For example, why do we love people? Why, why, did, why did we feel good when the kids came up and Evelyn uh, you know, taught them about missions for a little bit? Well, because we love children. Why do we love children? Well... Uh, the Christian would say, because God is love, and God is the, is the one who instituted the ideas of families. Every fatherhood in the world, the Bible says in one place, is modeled after God. He instituted all fatherhood. And we love children because God loves children. And we love our spouses because God is faithful to his people. And we love strangers because God loves everyone. And we love, we're supposed to love our enemies because God even loves his enemies. And um, the secular person says, no, love is a, a way of passing on our genes 
Because you see, if you're a loving person, there's a greater chance you'll get a mate. And if you get a mate, you'll reproduce. And if you get in trouble, um, somebody will come to your aid because you were nice to them. They'll be nice to you. And so you'll survive. So God is left out of it entirely. It's all, all has to do with evolutionary survival. God is not disproved. Christianity is not disproved. It's simply ignored as if it doesn't exist. There is one more thing I have to mention, sadly, and that is um, that the church, the faith, is often rejected because of the failures of Christians. Uh, churches have rigid traditions. They have boring preachers. They have judgmental people. The church is a social club, and it makes me feel excluded somehow. It's for all kinds of people who are like each other, and somehow I don't seem to be like them, and so they ignore me. The church is a place of, of uh, power struggles, and the church is always asking for money, and we're people pleasers, and wicked, and vain, and stupid, and quarrelsome, and the church does not welcome sinners. On the other hand, the church is full of sinners, and, and their sins aren't even interesting, they're just irritating. And so, so people don't want to be discipled. Well, why is there a mission that this world needs? Why do we have a mission to the world? And the answer is that God himself, in his character, moves toward people. One of the great statements in all the Bible is found in Exodus chapter 34. It says this, that God is, God says, I am the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Now what this tells us is two things. One is that God is love, and the other is that God is just. God is just, he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished, he sees sin and forgives sin. In other words, God sees and is offended by sin, and so God is just, and, and therefore humanity for our sins against him and against each other is under God's just condemnation. But God is loving. This passage says God abounds in love. He maintains love. He is faithful in his love. He doesn't love sporadically. He's always loving. He's compassionate, which is the feeling of love. He is gracious, which is love given to the undeserved. So God is, our, our short passage tells us in four different ways, God is loving. And in two ways, it says that he is also just. And this, this love and justice come together to lead him to send Jesus into this world. Because of our sin, we're alienated from God. But God is too loving, too compassionate, too gracious to let his creatures, again, he looks at us in a fatherly way, he's too compassionate to simply let us go. And that's why he sent Jesus, the Son of God, into this world. And Jesus came into this world, and because he's loving, and because he's just and wise and good, people were attracted to him. Jesus has a beautiful character, and he had the power to work miracles, and he was a teacher that was spellbinding, and people would listen to him for hours on end until they ran out of food and ran out of water. And, and so people were tr tremendously, constantly attracted to him. Of course, because Jesus is just and cares for the oppressed, he also spoke out against oppression in his own day. And because people loved him and followed him in great numbers and he spoke out against the corrupt powers, those powers became suspicious of Jesus. And they noticed he didn't follow all their traditions, and they were very sure their traditions were God's way. And so when he didn't follow their traditions, they accused him of being a sinner, even a blasphemer. And the Romans, of course, saw a following that could grow and grow, and they suspected he might be guilty of sedition. And so the very beauty of Jesus, the love, the kindness, the compassion, the teaching, the magnetic personality of Jesus, roused those who were envious and they killed him. It was um, the greatest tragedy and the greatest injustice that's ever occurred in human history. And yet God knows how to take a disaster and a tragedy and an injustice and to use it for good. The apostle Peter, speaking just a few weeks after Easter, told a crowd of people who'd gathered in the temple 
what God had in mind and how, how God did this. He said Jesus was handed over to be killed by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So wicked men killed Jesus. But God had a set purpose in this, and his purpose was to end the alienation and instead to reconcile humans to God. The price of, um, of sin is separation from God. The price of unbelief is that we want nothing to do with God. We say, I'm not interested. And God says, if you're not interested, then you're separated from me. But Jesus came and died on the cross to bear our guilt and our sin and our shame. He died for our guilt and sin and shame, and then rose again, proving that he exhausted the penalty for our sin, guilt, and shame. And he demonstrated God's love toward us so that we would be drawn to this God who loves us and be reconciled to him and come back into his family. So the death of Jesus was a tragedy but not a defeat because the death of Jesus led to the resurrection of Jesus and the defeat of the penalty and the power of sin. And that's why something very strange happened after Jesus was killed. See, the Romans knew there were... The Romans were the number one political power of the day, and, and they subjugated many peoples to their rule, and they were familiar with the idea that people try to rise up against Rome. And they knew that the way to stop a rebellion is to cut off the head, to kill the leader. And time after time after time, when a leader was slain, the movement dissipated. But when the leader of the Christian movement was slain, the movement didn't stop. It grew and grew and grew. And, and you can look at maps, you know, look at missional maps of the growth of the church, and you see that within 30 or 40 years, every major city in the eastern half of the Roman Empire and even the center of the Roman Empire had a Christian church. And there were lots of churches in Israel and what we would call today Turkey. And then, and then it spread to the western half of the Roman Empire and began to go outside the Roman Empire until... By the year 320 or so, there were outposts all throughout the Roman Empire, and, and it, it had radiated out throughout the world, even though, on the one hand, there, were no, there was no media, there were no schools, there were no radio stations, no CDs of, of wonderful speakers that you could give your friends. Um, there were no benefactors. There was, there was nothing, just word of mouth and people copying the Bible by hand and, and reading it to each other and copying it some more and travelers taking the message of Jesus where they went. So there was nothing, there were no powers to help the church, but there were great powers against the church. In the day of the apostles and beyond, you could be exiled, you could have your property seized, you could even be killed just for being a Christian. There's a letter um, that describes this from a Roman governor. He would be very much the same kind of person as Pontius Pilate. He governed a district of some tens of thousands of square miles, and uh, maybe a million people or so. And he was writing to the emperor, Emperor Trajan. Uh, the letter doesn't have a date on it, but it was um, you know, in, this emperor, so in, in this emperor's time, and you can pretty much establish the year 111, 112, or 113 AD when the letter was written. And Pliny uh, is, is concerned about the growth of Christianity in his uh, part of the empire. He says, you know, the temples are emptying out. Nobody's worshiping there anymore. People aren't going to the emperor worship the way they used to. And, and it's the Christian's fault. And now there's been a backlash, and people are accusing other people, their neighbors, of being Christians. They're denounced to me, he said, as Christians. And so he's writing the emperor saying, what should I do? He says, well, now I interrogate them. And those, I'm quoting, those who confessed, I interrogated again, threatening with punishment. And those who persisted to say they were Christians, I ordered executed. And he asked the emperor if he was doing the right thing. Now, Pliny, it's a long, fairly long letter. Pliny says, look, I'm not telling you that the Christian faith is dangerous in itself. The Christians gather on a set day, Sunday, before dawn, and share a meal and swear to live with integrity. That's all he can really see. And they pray to 
Christ as to a God. But it seems like a forbidden association. And the people won't bow to the emperor, and they're so obstinate. And if nothing else, if nothing else, their sheer stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy leads me to conclude that they deserve to be killed. That's what it was like to be a Christian. And yet the faith spread and spread. That's the way it is today in many lands. In the Philippines, we have supported missionaries who are anonymous, and they've been slain. They've been slain. Because they took the gospel into Muslim towns. Their crime was to talk about Jesus. In India, we have missionaries that we support. They're Indians. They're not Americans. They blend in. They know the language. They know the culture. Who are under death threats all the time. All the time. Because they're too successful. Because they're starting schools and planting churches and trying to do justice for widows. It's true today. Why, why would people risk death? Why would people, like my friend, the atheist Mike, why would they sometimes say, you know what, I do want to follow Jesus? And the answer is because they would like to know God. Because there is a hunger for direction in life, yes. Aspiration in life, eternal life, something beyond this life, purpose and suffering, yes. <laughs> But beyond all that, there is a desire to know God. There is a hunger in the human being to know, to know the living God, to commune with him, to, to pray, to have a sense of direction and purpose, and, and to long to see him again one day, even face to face. Some people will say, well, that's, that's fleeing this world. Not at all. Jesus came into this world as a real flesh and blood human being, and he rose from the dead to show his care for this world, which he'll renew one day. To know God and to love this life are not opposites. People think about the relationship with Jesus in many ways. The Bible calls him Lord. I don't know, how do you think about Jesus? Um, People think of him as a teacher, as a friend, as a role model as a refuge in a crisis, as one who teaches how to live. He's all these things, and he's more. The Bible says he is is with us. We can become like him. Jesus is our guide. He's our friend. The Great Commission says, I am with you always, even at the end of the age. There's a new sport I read about called free diving. Free diving is like scuba diving, except you don't get any scuba gear. It's like um, snorkeling, except you go deep. People have, free, have gone free diving down to a depth of 700 feet. You think, how on earth do you do that? Well, you take in a lot of air, I guess. Um, you learn how to expand your lungs. You learn how to suppress the urge to breathe when you're 200 feet underwater because, you know, it's dangerous. Um, If you free dive, you have a guide who goes with you. And they take deep breaths with you and they go down to 50 feet and 70 feet and 100 feet and so forth with you. And, And if you have that urge to breathe, they help you not do that. Of course, If you suppress the urge too long, you black out and you die, and so they don't let you go too long and black out and die either. The guide is with you, or else you're a free diver for a very short span of time. Jesus says, I am with you, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission uh, begins when Jesus meets his disciples, as he said he would, on a mountain, and um, said in our passage, some hesitated. The world's full of hesitators, and even, you know, sometimes disciples hesitate. We're not quite sure. We're willing to follow Jesus all the way, to do everything he says, even if, even if we kind of want to. We all hesitate at times, and Jesus speaks to hesitators, and he says, I'm going to give you a great commission, go to the world to make disciples, and I'm going I'm to tell you two things. 
that hold it together. First, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, and I'm with you always, so I have the right to command, and I'm with you as I command. I'll stand by him. I'm just going to command you and let you go. And, and my command is make disciples. That's the core command that Jesus has. He does not say, tell people about me. He doesn't say, share the gospel. He doesn't say, grow your church. He doesn't say, make converts. All those things are assumed. He says, after you share the gospel, we want people to believe and to grow so they're disciples and they can train the next generation of disciples. The church is almost 2,000 years old. If a generation is 25 years, we're in the 80th generation of disciples and disciples and disciples, each ready for the next generation. And and Jesus tells us how to do it. He says, first of all, go. Go and make disciples. That means that you don't just wait. You don't just wait for people to talk to you about Jesus. You go. It means you have made friends of your neighbors. It means you have open conversations with the people with whom you work. It means that your associations include more than Christians all the time. Real relationships with people who do not share your faith. And it means that you get up in the morning or go to bed at night and you ask yourself the question or you pray, Lord, is there a way in which I can enter into a real conversation with somebody I know who does not share my faith? And if you pray that prayer, I guarantee you there are openings and you will see them if you're looking for them, if you want to find them. And if you're afraid to talk, then give somebody a CD or give them a book or give them a zip drive or something. Invite them to an event. Go. Next, Jesus says baptize. Now, we baptize, and baptism signifies, as we baptize people, um, that they belong to God in the covenant, whether as children or as adults. And the water of baptism says that Jesus cleanses. But there's something else to baptism, and that is when you stand up, which all the people of the early church had to do, when you stand up and receive baptism for the first time or join the church, you say, I belong to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His name is on me. And you're saying, here I stand with these people. The church is so disappointing. There's so many sinful people. There are so many people who take advantage, start silly conflicts, have power struggles, get divorced, get addicted, don't like other Christians, have bad social skills, don't brush their teeth properly, you name it. But the Christian says, these are my sinners. These are the people I stand with. I am not ashamed to stand with all the people who name Jesus. I'll say it a different way. The church does not know such a thing as an un... Sorry, the New Testament does not know an unchurched Christian. We belong to God and we're willing to say so. Third, we go, we baptize, and we teach everything Jesus commanded. I have a red-letter Bible, and um, it was given to me for free. There is a plague on red-letter Bibles, you know, because red-letter Bibles imply that there are some words that are more important than others. All the words in the Bible are God's words, and we should teach everything. The parts of your Bible that are underlined, that you know, you've loved, you've memorized, you've heard before, and the parts that make you wince and skip ahead. It's all God's word. We should obey everything. And it's such a great comfort to know that that the Gospel of Matthew was written by a man who was himself changed. Matthew was a tax collector when Jesus met him. He was a traitor to his own people. And he failed. He abandoned Jesus when Jesus was crucified, just like all the others. Jesus called him a man of little faith. But now here he is writing the Gospel of Matthew. He became Jesus' disciple, and he's saying, you can become my disciple. He said, just as I became Jesus' disciple, so for you too. So for you too. Easter has implications, my friends. The church has problems, and Christianity does not always do a good job of representing the Lord. No doubt about it. But Jesus is Lord, and he did rise from the dead, and he did bear our sin. 
And people do want to know God, and they can, we can, you can, by believing in him. And we can follow him all of our days with his authority everywhere we go. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would move us to love your resurrection, to love you, to be your disciples, to be your disciples in the world, everywhere we go, going and teaching and growing and leaning on you. And we pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We hope you found this week's message encouraging and helpful. As always, we invite you to attend West County Fellowship if you're in the St. Louis area. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at the West County Family YMCA in Chesterfield. Until then, know that God's grace is for you, and he comes to bring new life.